Welcome to the Pat Dooley Show, Episode 4, Attack of the Clones. Today we're going to talk about the Florida-Tennessee game as well as their upcoming game with the Gators. Be joined a little bit later by Chris Doring. You know, Chris Doring had a pretty good game against Kentucky a long time ago. Wow, it's amazing when you think about how long ago that was. Was it 15, 16 years ago? Wow, that is amazing. And we'll go through our lists and three things, and we'll also do, of course, our Dr. Football segment, either or with Chris Doring as well. But uh, let's just talk a little bit about the Florida-Tennessee game. Obviously, Florida didn't play its best game. Tim Tebow didn't play his best game. Florida had a lot of issues, although apparently they're not supposed to bring up when guys are sick. That's been forbidden by the Tennessee Mafia. Uh, but, you know, the Gators just weren't on, clicking on all cylinders because they didn't have to. There was no point in that game where you looked at it and went, wow, Florida's in trouble. They were never in trouble. They were never going to lose the game, and they went very conservative, a little tighter than I would have liked to have seen them go. But they did get the win, and that's what really matters. And, of course, the Gators move on and face Kentucky. Florida has beaten Kentucky 22 times. I put this line in my column. I wonder how many of you caught this. I said, everybody knows where they were the last time uh, Florida lost to Kentucky. They're at a Monkees concert. And, of course, some people say, wait a minute, the Monkees were in the city. No, the Monkees reunited in 1986, and they were on tour. Aha, uh -huh. didn't know that, did you? But uh, that's the last time Florida lost to Kentucky. Does that play into the game? No, of course not. Does it play into it for the seniors that they've never beaten Florida? Yeah, I think there's an issue there. Does it play into it for Florida that they've never known the taste of losing? I don't think so. I think they know that this is a good Kentucky team. It's not a great one, but it is a good one, and Rich Brooks is a very good coach. He kind of convinced me of that. I'll tell you a story back in 2005, which would have been Urban's first season. Urban, uh, after the game, they were up 49-7. Uh, Kentucky came back on him a little bit in the second half, mainly because Josh Portis was in the game kicking the ball around. And after the game, I, I, uh, I asked Urban about it. He said, I knew that team would come back. That's a good coach. And I went, really? Rich Brooks? Are you kidding me? I didn't believe him. I thought we totally were going to disagree on that. But look what Rich Brooks has done since then. Three straight bowl wins. Okay. They were an AutoZone Liberty Bowl and a couple of Music City Bowls. But they're three, you know, for Kentucky, they ought to erect a statue to him outside the stadium. Uh, they, he's got a good program going. Even with the loss of Jeremy Jarman, they're off to a good start. Now, I know beating uh, Miami and, of Ohio and Louisville is not great, but it's better than not beating them. So I think Florida's going to have a fight up there, especially with where Florida is offensively with their situation at wide receiver and with all the injuries that they, and, and flu that they have. Oh, that's right. We're not supposed to mention the flu. I forgot. You know, the game I'll never forget at Kentucky was, uh, I think it was 2003, when uh, Chris Leak had his first start as a Gator and it was hot. It's not supposed to be hot there. It's never supposed to be hot in Lexington. And it was so hot, I was, I was drenched literally after the game because they don't have air conditioning in the press box. And uh, you know, it was a great game for Chris Leak though. Everybody knows the story about that. The round mound of touchdowns. Uh, Jared Lorenzen, one of my favorite players to watch, didn't get it done. But watch out for this Kentucky team this week, especially Trevard Lindley, really good player. If you look at it last year, Tebow threw two picks during the regular season, one of them to Trevard Lindley. All right, we're going to talk about the three things we learned last weekend. And number one, there were only two stories last week in Gainesville. One, Florida kills Tennessee. Two, they don't. Who won the loss of the game and really didn't have anything to do with anything? Uh, it was very disappointing to see some of the stuff that was written afterwards and still talked about. But the one thing I've learned about all this is the reason that the Tennessee coach is still mouthing off in the middle of the week is because they play Ohio this week. Okay? Nobody cares about them right now. They're under the radar again. Nobody's going to care about him probably for the rest of the season unless he keeps mouthing off. So don't expect that stuff to end. The number two thing we learned this week is that Southern Cal is the opposite of David. Southern Cal doesn't beat teams that are, that are supposed to be better than them because they don't play very many of them, if any. I can't remember the last time Southern Cal was an underdog. But what they do, do is they lose to the Davids. Southern Cal is the best big game team you want out there. They're the worst little game team. Everybody knew this year. It was going to happen again. When, when, when? Well, it didn't take long this year. Washington knocks them off. And the number three thing we learned this week, FSU and Miami are back for now. Let's wait until they play, oh, I don't know, four games until we declare them back. Sure, FSU looked great against Brigham Young, but Brigham Young turned the ball over a bunch, and they're not that good. They, I, I said this all along. I think Oklahoma was devastated with the Bradford injury. I'm not making excuses for them, but I think it killed their team mentally, and that had a lot to do with why Brigham Young won. Plus, it goes back to one of my Ten Commandments of college football. Don't take too much from first games, and don't take too much from one game to the next. Every game's its own game. I think that's the second commandment. Florida State sure looked bad against Jack State, but not against uh, Brigham Young. Those games had nothing to do with each other. And Miami really looked good right now. I like the way Ja'Cory Harris is playing. I mean, you've got a Heisman Trophy candidate there, even though he's only started three games in his career. 
candidate, I said. There's about 90 of those. But let's see how Miami does against Virginia Tech and Oklahoma the next two weeks. Then I'll be ready to say they're back. Nobody's back because they go 2-0. Nobody's back because they go 2-1. You're back when you're back, and I'll tell you when you're back. Now we're going to take a break, come back with our interview with Chris Doring. You remember him, former Florida wide receiver. All right, welcome back to the Pat Dooley Show. I'm here with my special guest today, Chris Doring. Of course, it's Kentucky week, and we can't have anybody but Chris Doring. Did you ever catch any other passes? I don't think I did. I mean, that was, uh, that was funny because that was one of my first real games that I contributed right. in, and most people, you know, they link my name to Kentucky, and really I caught, after that game, 29 more touchdowns. That was the only one anybody remembers, though, uh, although the one I remember – corner post route in the, against FSU yeah. to set the SEC record. Yeah, that was one of my favorites. I had bookend career moments in my mind. <laughs> at the Lexington game there in 93, two catches for touchdowns, and uh, one of them the game winner. And then, of course, my last career game in the Swamp with the record setter. So I couldn't have been a better story. Now, when you go back to that game, I'm sure it runs through your mind every once in a while, just all the stuff that led up to it. I mean, I, I think a lot of people don't remember that Dean and Werfel combined for seven picks yeah. in that game. Yeah. You shouldn't, they shouldn't even been in the game. <laughs> It might have been the last time they were really in a game but against Florida, but uh, when you guys get back on the, on the – Harrison Houston had the big kick return. Mm -hmm. When you get back on the field for that series, what are you, what's going through your mind? You know, it really was not a sense of panic at all, even though we had played miserably the entire night, seven picks, as you mentioned, quarterbacks being shuffled in and out. Uh, we felt like we could move the ball against them. We had moved it and made mistakes. So if we eliminated those mistakes, we felt like we had a chance. But you, you touched on Harrison Houston. The return there was probably the biggest mm -hmm. play in that drive, setting us up with good field position to be able to go down the field. And then, you know, Eric Rett made some good plays on that drive. And uh, uh, it was just a, a great team effort. Yeah, it was. And uh, obviously the play before they threw you the ball and, and just missed. Yeah. And if you'd caught it, we might not. Chris that, Dory that might was, have been an afterthought. That was the ironic <laughs> thing about it. We ran the same play the play before. I got held at the line of scrimmage and Danny threw it. I, I made a, almost a great one-handed catch. It probably would have been a highlight type yep. catch, but uh, we would have run out of time and wouldn't have been able to ultimately you know, have another shot at the end zone like we did. And, I mean, where were the safeties on that play? They played two-man. And uh, if you look at our receivers, um, out to my right was Jack Jackson. To my left on the other side of the formation was Aubrey Hill in the slot. Or, um, I'm sorry, Harrison Houston in the slot and Willie Jackson on the other side. So of the four, probably I'm the, the least threatening of all. Um, still are. Yeah, still are. <laughs> Danny did a good job of looking to Jack and kind of pumping down the right sideline. The safety split, and I had a uh, linebacker cover me, man, underneath. And, you know, it didn't it was, work out. didn't work out well for them, no. And you got into it with the fans a little bit after that. I did. Game. You know, I went back, and it was funny. The other day I was doing some stuff for the SEC networks, and uh, – they had a highlight of that, and they showed me after the game or after the play talking with the fans. I said, let's cut the tape before that. That's not the kind of sportsmanship we want to promote. So I was a little immature at the time. Well, Florida could probably use Chris Doring right now, wide receiver, with the issues they have right, uh, out there right now. You, you obviously stay with the team, follow the team. A uh, big fan of Irvin Myers, I know. And uh, when you watched that team Saturday against Tennessee, what, what went through your mind? You know, it, it was a little bit of a uh, – it wasn't all that inspiring of a performance, but it was a victory nonetheless. And I think that um, fans have gotten spoiled here. You know, all the way back to Coach mm -hmm. Spurrier and, and what ultimately led him to leave was the expectation levels being too high. I think um, wins weren't necessarily good enough. And uh, even though we were able to get the victory the other day, it wasn't in the kind of fashion that, that we would have liked. But you got to give credit to Monty Kiffin or uh, to, to, to Monty for the defensive plan he came right. up with. And certainly their players, 1-11 to 11 on defense, they got a, as good as anybody in the conference. Yeah, in fact, I wrote about that in the Saturday Gainesville Sun. You can read it at GatorSports.com, which you're already on if you're watching this, that Monty Kiffin didn't really lay down the blueprint for how to defend Florida. If you got an Eric Berry and you spend all summer trying to defend a team and you got really good defenders and the other team's trying, you know you're not going to do anything stupid to make mistakes, so the other team's not going to have to score. Yeah, and, and here's a great trivia, or not trivia, but stat for you. Florida actually gained more yards against Tennessee this year than they did last year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I, I might buy into that whole blueprint theory, but uh, I'll tell you my favorite Chris Doring story. I'll embarrass him here. <laughs> and it's not the night you came over for my 50th birthday. That was fun, though. That was fun. <laughs> anybody, anybody who brings Danny Werfel to the party <laughs> and a bottle of Crown, you know it's a good day. But uh, we, I go to cover their – remember the Swamp Shooters yep. used to have that team? Yep. And they asked me to come over and do a story. So I go over there, and I'm about done, and, and they're playing their game, and Kerwin Bell says, hey – we're going to call timeout. We're going to, I want you to pretend like you're leaving. As you're leaving, step in bounds. I'm going to throw you the ball, take a three-pointer. I'll be funny. So I do. I've got flip-flops on. I step, I get the ball, I step in bounds. 
go take the shot. Dorian comes out of nowhere and slaps it. <laughs> just whacks it into the stands. And I'm like, dude, and he goes, I'm a competitor, man. Ultra, uh, ultra I'm competitive. Com you wouldn't even let your buddy get a uh, shot off. Well, I, uh, and along the same lines with the Swamp Shooters, we played one night and this, uh, this girl on the other team draining three after three. Finally, I got tired of it, so I blocked <laughs> her shot and I caught a bunch of crap from the, the guys after that. Chris is one of the great stories in Florida athletics, of course, being a walk-on and becoming a star and, and going on playing a lot in the NFL. I mean, when's your pension kick in on that? Uh, I'm getting close now. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword because your insurance runs out after five years, but mm -hmm. after five years, you're eligible to start collecting some of the NFL stuff uh, benefits as well. So, it, you know, they, they've taken good care of us, and I'm you know excited about being able to cash in a little bit on that. It's a good thing you didn't play in like the 50s and 60s. That's those, true. Those, those guys, guys yeah, they, they, they're hurting. Well, uh, obviously you're in a lot of things. Just let the, the uh, viewers, I guess I want to say listeners, readers, whatever, but let the viewers know. I know you got the mortgage business yeah, going. Yeah, I got the mortgage. You got the radio going. Got the radio still here in Gainesville and Ocala and uh, doing some TV with um, ESPN's regional coverage, doing some CSS work. I'll be in Starkville, Mississippi on mm. October 3rd for Georgia Tech, uh, Mississippi State. You know where I'll be? Huh. On my couch. That's a off that's open for the day Gators. Dating. That's right. My favorite day. You know, some people like Christmas, some people like Thanksgiving, Fourth of July. Me, Gators. Open I've spent date. open dates with you before you too, with the multiple TVs set up. And the chili. Yeah. The chili, the fifty dollar yeah. chili going. <laughs> well, we're, that's uh, going to do it for our segment with Chris. He's going to be back in a little bit to do either or. But right now, it's time to look at my latest list. All right, it's time to do our weekly list, and you know I like to do this every week. We uh, rank things one through five. This week, who are Florida's biggest rivals right now? Not last year, not next year, not 10 years ago, but right now. Number five, believe it or not, I'm putting the LSU in there. And the reason is because of what happened two years ago when Florida went there. It was a hard-fought game, tough game. Uh, they had Tebow's cell phone number. They were bugging him. And everybody's been pointing to the LSU game more than any game this year as the big game for Florida. So I'm sneaking Flo LSU in there at number five. Number four, we have the mighty Miami Hurricanes. Florida didn't even play them this year, but they're still the venom. They're still the hatred. Miami hates Florida, I think, more than Miami hates anybody else, even more than FSU. So even though Florida didn't play them again until 2013, I'm putting Miami number four on the list. Number three, it's Georgia. Yeah, I know. Georgia should be everybody's number one rival, and a lot of people feel that way. I was there for Lindsey Scott. I still feel like it was, it, it's a huge rivalry, and we all know it is, but some things have happened to change things. So, Because number two now, in my opinion, right now as we sit here today is Tennessee. With all the stuff that went on with Tennessee's coach in the last few weeks, with this feeling that Tennessee won a game that they lost, they went home with L's on the side of their helmets instead of T's. That's the last thing I saw. The bottom line is I think Tennessee is back, back up there, back ahead of Georgia. A year ago at this time, Georgia might be number one, uh, and not, not uh, Florida State. Who is number one? Florida State. And I feel that way just because you got to really hate your rivals, and both teams really hate each other. And I think Florida fans root hard against FSU in every game they play. I still think FSU right now, just slightly, it's like 1, 1A, one 1B, one and then the others. But how many schools have three or four rivals? Not very many. When you think about it, who's, what's Auburn got? Alabama. I mean, what's Tennessee got? they got two, Alabama and Florida. Very few schools have three and even four, and I think Florida has four rivals when you include Miami. All right, so that's the list of the Florida's five biggest rivals right now, right this second as I stand here today. It may change in a week. Who knows? Right now we're going to take a break, come back with either or, that segment where we decide four big questions this week with Chris Dorn. Okay, it's time to play our weekly segment of Either Or with Chris Doring, former Florida wide receiver, former Redskin, former Colt, former what else? You got enough time to name all of them? You'd probably be better off naming the ones I wasn't on the You team. weren't on the, on the uh, Chargers, Never right? played okay. for the Chargers or the Bucks. Yeah. Or the, well, the Jaguars for a small bit. I was there time. and got drafted there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Should have kept them. Look, what, look where they are now. <laughs> and they're, they're one of our Either Or questions. Let's go to the first one, though. If Lane Kiffin and Lindsey Scott are both drowning in a lake, which one do you toss a life preserver to? Ooh, I, you know what? I'd probably toss it to Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin is probably less of a threat to me. You know, uh, <laughs> Lindsey Scott ruined my childhood, <laughs> so I think that one probably scarred me much more deeply than Lane Kiffin has. Well, I know Lindsey Scott really well. Got to know him when I was covering Jacksonville. Wasn't any more happy than you were on yeah. that day, but I like Lindsey Scott. He's a good guy. He's been through some tough times. Well, I'd probably throw it to him. I'll tell you, the um, after the 94 championship game against Alabama, when I mm -hmm. caught the game winner at the end, First guy to come interview me is Buck Ballou. I said, man, I, hate, I hated you when I was a kid. He's actually a good guy He as is well, a good guy. So. 
It's funny because I saw him in the tunnel going out there, and I said, you know what's funny? Chris had a dream the night before he was going to catch the winning touchdown. Yeah. Pass, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. See? So yeah. We, we both ran into that night. Number two, who do you think would get more booze in Lexington, you or Rick Pitino? Oh, I, I, Rick Pitino is probably a much bigger name than what Chris Doring is, but I will say that uh, people put me in the same – kind of uh, group as, as uh, Christian Leitner. So I, you know, that's not bad company there. I'll take that. Yeah, well, that's not bad at all. But uh, it, it, you know, it's funny. We had somebody on from uh, Lexington the other day, and he you know, continued to say how much they hate me up there. So <laughs> that's that right? the well, biggest compliment you can have. It is. Absolutely. I didn't think they'd still remember you. They, they do for some reason. You know, I, it's 16 years 16 ago. 16 years ago this September 11th. Is that why it was a September, September 11th? September 11th, 1993. So some good memories of yes. September 11th. Yes. Uh, you know, Robbie Andrews' wife was born on that day. And so. uh, Chris Harry's um, That's kid right. as well. That's yeah. right, because she was born. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, yeah. number three, which will happen first? Jacksonville's NFL franchise leaves town or Florida Georgia moves to Atlanta every other year? Uh, I don't think Florida Georgia is going to move anytime soon. I think the Jacksonville move is probably pretty imminent, especially with the way the team started and the lack of interest. Um, but I do believe, you know, should Wayne Weaver actually draft Tim Tebow, might be the saving grace for yeah. that city. That's going to save it because if your backup quarterback selling your tickets, you're yeah. in great shape. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I think they're in trouble. I really do. That crowd the other night was about 35,000. Yeah. Uh, and, and the funny thing is, we all knew Jacksonville was a great city for football college football not pro football <laughs> but the problem is they've never embraced the college game tom coughlin always tried to separate right. the jaguar fans from the florida or fsu fans and that was the biggest mistake they could have made but they always assume that people from gainesville will go yeah I mean, people from gainesville aren't going to go there unless they, you load it up with gators that's right exactly and even when they did that it yeah. didn't work yeah what do they do they cut mike peterson fred taylor how's that working out for him anyway? i went too all right last question on either or who's a bigger pk young alumni doug dickey or i guess it should be alumnus doug dickey or travis mcgriff Ooh, uh, golly, both guys, great players. I'm going to have to probably give it to Doug Dickey because he gets the edge for being a former head coach and athletic director as well. I Travis, he, you know, his story is still unwritten. Maybe he'll go on <laughs> to great heights like that as well, though. Yeah, Doug Dickey also is in the College Football Hall of Fame. That's so true. I, I'm with you on that. That's a good one. All right, appreciate Chris Doran for coming in. Now let's see what's in Dr. Football's email bag. Let's see, we got an uh, email from Gary and Alpharetta. Ooh, we're all, all the way up in Georgia. Dear Dr. Football, my wife used to understand that Saturday nights were about college football, but now she's grabbing the remote and going back and forth between Bravo and the Food Network. What should I do? New TV or new wife? Well, my gut feeling is that if you're that into football and you're that into ignoring your wife, you better hang on to her. I don't think you could find somebody else. Go get a TV, a second TV, put it up in your office, your bedroom, your bathroom, somewhere. It's not that hard to split the cable off, and you can watch football while she is watching Top Chef, my favorite show. That's going to do it for this edition of the Pat Dooley Show, Episode 4, Attack of the Clones. We'll be back next week. It's an open week, but we aren't going away. I want to thank everybody for clicking on and making this the most widely viewed show in the history of the web. Ha! I made that up totally, but who knows? It might be. All right, till next time, Pat Dooley, so long from the Sunshine State. <laughs>